imagine that on finally this sun-filled day, we lived in a world where all of humanity understood that each of us was created in the divine image. How might we behave so differently? There would be dignity in our difference. Race and gender faith would not divide us, but would be celebrated. Bigotry and hatred would give way to tolerance and love. Benevolence would supplant the malevolence of xenophobia. We would not shun or put down, despise, exclude, denigrate, belittle, or malign the other. Rather, the other, Jew, Christian, Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, Baha, Zoroastrian, and a myriad of others would become our brothers and sisters. The power of the truth of Genesis is that we were indeed created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. And so we can discern, we have free will, we are not helpless victims of fear or bigotry, but rather masters of our own destiny. We can choose how we see others. We can choose how we treat others. We can stand up when the sacred is violated, when fear or faith is used to teach hatred. In his book, Not in God's Name, Confronting Religious Violence, Rabbi Sachs writes the following. The central question of Genesis is, are human beings friends or strangers, brothers or others? Is it a sustained exploration of recognition and estrangement, closeness and distance? It tells us that if only we were to listen closely to the voice of the other, we would find that we are members of the human family under the parenthood of God. When others become brothers and conflict is transformed into conciliation, we have begun the journey to a society as a family and the redemptive drama can begin. What he is telling us essentially is the fate of the Abrahamic faith is in our hands. If religion can be taught to engender hate, then it be, can, can be taught to bring about love. We started on November 11th with the discussion of the book and we were invited with the American University to hear Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. On November 13, 130 were killed in Paris before we had even had time to open up the covers of our books to read. And then San Bernardino happened, and then Brussels happened, and in between we have heard rhetoric that Muslims should be registered in this country. We have heard rhetoric that Muslims should be monitored in this country. We have heard that all Muslim immigrants should be, all Muslim immigration should be frozen. Anti-Semitism has been on the rise in Europe and here in America. Fear is real. In December, Bishop Buddy gathered religious leaders and we participated and we marched in faith over fear. And we marched and we stood in front of three houses of worship and we talked about the opportunity to choose a different path. And tonight I've asked three individuals, and I'm not going to go through their bios. They're so long, but they are in your program to share and to speak on why and if interfaith dialogue is needed now more than ever. And the reason I've asked these individuals is because I have worked with them over a period of time. They are not only known to us. Bishop Buddy is a Washington leader, but she is a national and international leader. And her compassion, her commitment to interfaith dialogue is second to none. And Imam Johari Malik, Abdul Malik, 
has been a friend of mine in this community and has stood shoulder to shoulder, side to side on almost every issue. And when Jews are being threatened or there's been something on the metro or something anti-Israel in anything, he is almost the first to respond. In addition, Bruce Feiler began a journey with me many years ago after 9-11 when we together created and brought together with then Bishop John Chain and the National Cathedral, the first Abraham Summit. I am proud that they come this night because today and this evening, we're not going to just talk platitudes. We're going to sit face to face, we hope, this evening. We're going to hear the real challenges of interfaith and hopefully we'll be inspired to work. They will, I call upon them to speak in this order. We will first hear from Bruce Feiler, then we will hear from Bishop Buddy, and then Imam Joharli Abdul Malik. It is my privilege to welcome Bruce Feiler to the pulpit. Good evening, Shabbat Shalom. If you're not already, a believer in the beauty and miracle of interfaith dialogue, consider that two rabbis, a cantor, a bishop, an imam, a know-it-all author, and two sets of parents of bar mitzvah students have all agreed to stand before a full house of open-minded and open-hearted worshipers and get you all to dinner in under one hour. Um, <laughs> I, as uh, my name may Bruce Lustig, uh, just said, I first set foot in this congregation 14 years ago, almost to the week, to talk about my book, Walking the Bible, about a year I spent retracing the five books of Moses through the deserts of the Middle East. And that was in the wake of 9-11, and I shared with him back in his office that I had just written a book about Abraham that grew out of 9-11, uh, Abraham as the shared ancestor of 14 million Jews, 2 billion Christians, and 1 billion Muslims around the world, and that I had this crazy idea that we could use this as a way to launch dialogue. And Rabbi Lustig said what I have come to understand is an expression of his character, which is, I want to be a leader. I want this congregation to be a leader. I want this community to be a leader. And as he said, we had 600 people uh, come to this congregation in the middle of the sniper crisis, uh, for those of you who were here at that time, to stand up and say, we want to begin this conversation. So to the question in five minutes of what I have learned in the intervening 15 years, it is that we all need to do this, that we have to get over that thing that our mothers all told us, which is that we can't talk about religion and politics in public. Well, guess what? The people who are speaking about religion and politics in public are far too often doing it through an expression of hate. So this is a political town and this is a political season. So let's do what the politicians do. We've got a choice. It's open warfare and conflict among the religions or it's coexistence among the religions. Which do you want? Because if you want coexistence, it depends, it demands. It only survives if there is dialogue. So I stand before you today, it's 15 years later, we still need leaders, but guess what? The leaders are up here, and all around the world, the leaders are doing it. It's now time to pass the torch. And these leaders need, amongst all of you, to grab the torch and say, I want to be a leader, too. I first came to the Christian faith in a conscious way when I was 16 in the context of a spiritual community that saw itself as the one path, a very small, narrow path that excluded not only all of those of other faiths, but the majority of other Christians. Because of circumstances in my family, I needed to leave the household where I was living and return to my mother's household across the country and the community in which my faith had been born 
did not want me to go because they were worried that I that my salvation would be in peril because I was returning to my mother's home and she was, God forbid, an Episcopalian. <laughs> and at 16, although I loved these people deeply and I knew that my faith had taken root because of them and because of their example, these were good people, I knew at 16 that they were wrong because they didn't know my mother. They didn't know my mother. And I knew that she was a woman of God. And thus began my journey of understanding that when a relationship crosses over what seems to be a barrier, our understanding of what is, what is the nature of our human identity as children of God expands. Most of my work in this expanding piece has been done within my own tradition because within Christianity we are so divided among those of us who feel we are on the right path. And I feel a tremendous responsibility within my tradition to help break down those barriers. Now, because I have been blessed with so many good, good friends among, the, my, among my Jewish brothers and sisters, my Muslim brothers and sisters, I have had no problem whatsoever in that expanding appreciation within myself that I grow every time I am in authentic commun commun community and communication with a person of faith in another tradition, that my appreciation and love of God grows and my own commitment to Christ can grow. But I stand as part of a wide swath of Christianity, among whom are some of those who would choose hate. And I have a relationship to them as well. And I feel it is part of my calling to stand in the gap with all of you in a commitment to solidarity and to a common understanding of our oneness under God. And at the same time, to stand in witness with them to say, there is another way. And what you fear is not the reality that, is, that I know, because you don't know, my friends who are such profound people of faith, who love peace and long for unity and seek a world where we all can find our, our path to God. Rabbi Sachs in his book asked, um, said that most of the time people of different traditions and different understandings can coexist in peace, but not in turbulent times and not in, not in troubled times. And we live in turbulent and troubled times, and the fear is rising. And so it is all the more imperative for, thus, for those of us who have friends across the boundaries that would otherwise divide to lock arms, to look into one another's eyes, and then stand united in friendship with those who are afraid and say, there is no reason to fear uh, because God chooses God does not exclude. Because there is one path, there can be other paths as well. And we all can sit under our own tree and fig vine. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> have to do it that way. Tonight we have to ask ourselves a very fundamental question. It's a question that humanity has been asking itself ever since the beginning. Now, I want to share with you just very briefly that before I got involved in this work, Bruce, you might know I was a geneticist. And there is a principle that is outlined in the Quran that says, if God had wanted to, we could have been all been made the same. And I first read that in the Quran. I didn't know much about genetics, but then we started cloning. 
And I realized that, wow, we, we, I guess we all could have been exactly the same. But that in God's infinite wisdom, we have been created into different groups. The Quran says, لِتَعَرَفُوا That we might know one another. There is something about the purpose of our creation that God wants us to be different so that we can get to know each other. And then the Quran gives a narrative about why. That we might compete with one another in doing good. Now Satan will come to us and say, well, you know, really, I, standing before God, says, I'm better than the human being. Look at the human being. They're going to create bloodshed. Some of them are going to believe and some of them are going to disbelieve. And they're going to be full of rancor and disobedience. And God replies in the Quran to Satan that I know something that you don't know. And that is that there is something in the human spirit that makes us better. We have free will. We have the ability that when the instruction says, do not enter the burning building, a person independent of their race, their religion, their class, will say, I think I hear the sound of a child in that building, and I, against all logic, will risk my life to save the other. There is something about each and every human being. And in this diversity, you get a chance to experience what it means to overcome. Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of his skin color. No one is born hating another because of their background or their religion. It is people that must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, then they can be taught to learn to love. See, right now we have some television programming that seems to be uh, specializing and normalizing hate. And those of us who believe that this is the wrong message, unfortunately, we feel like we're in the minority. I have good news for you. Nelson Mandela said, love comes more naturally to the human heart than the opposite. People really do want to love. Our challenge after almost 34 years of working with the Interfaith Conference of Metropolitan Washington, I learned that in this exchange, my involvement with Bruce Lustig doesn't make me become Jewish. <laughs> Don't laugh, I think about it. <laughs> Especially when I hear the cantor, I'm saying, we need to have a cantor in my mosque. <laughs> but I know that what happens in our exchange is that I look into my own tradition and try to get deeper. That Bruce looks at the interaction with the Muslim community and says, how could I take the best of what that community has that I see in my Torah and my Talmud and the Mishnah and say, how can I get my people back on that track? That competition is what makes us great. Why God wants diversity among us. So today I'm telling you as I go over time by 12 seconds, that some ask why and others ask why not before we turn to the elenu and we're going to read a special text that actually rabbi skloop pointed out fits the moment i want to say that tonight when we go into dinner for those who are there that on this journey that we have taken, looking at this and facilitating or whatever, 
This is not about platitudes. This is not about easy answers. This is also recognizing that the three of us have very different theological points of view. We often look at the same story and take totally different messages from it. And we feel that those messages command us to respond. And tonight we hope to begin the dialogue of what happens when those commands seem to be in conflict. So I have to tell you that we will also deal with this and we're going to ask the people there Tonight, we're going to ask people to ask, what are the questions that don't get asked? We may not be able to answer them, but we are not scared of them. One of the most incredible things that our B'nai Mitzvah kids are going to have tonight is that there's a relationship between the text and discerning and choice. In Judaism, there's a connection between belief and action. And therefore, we're not scared to ask questions because that will be the only way in that type of dialogue that we will be able to discern of how we can all fulfill God's desire.